Good to go? All set? Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Sarah Rosen Wartell. I'm the president here at Urban, and I want to thank everyone uh, here for joining us at what I am confident will be a very interesting conversation um, that at its heart is really about how do we uh, help public policy stay relevant when the society that it's governing is changing. Um, a few moments of housekeeping. Uh, we have a live webcast, and this event will be streamed and available online afterwards. Uh, those of you who are not in the room, if you want to be part of the Q&A questions later, we encourage you to send your questions to us at events at urban.org, and we'll collect those and uh, mix them in with the other Q&A. Um, and we encourage everyone who's alive here or online to <laughs> Those of you who are not live, this may prove more challenging. <laughs> but for those of you who can, uh, more importantly, who are live and uh, online, uh, if you want to tweet to use the live at urban hashtag. Um, now, this ultimately is an event that doesn't sound unusual to things that we've done here before. It's about tax system complexity. And we have lots of work from the Tax Policy Center and others uh, that have happened and conversations that we've had about complexity. Um, but I think the new and interesting twist that we're adding to the conversation today is uh, the additional level of complexity that we have continued to create, inadvertently perhaps, as families have become more complicated. In many ways, we have a system that was designed for the world of the white picket fence when there was a mother, a daughter, 2.2 children, and a dog uh, that somehow or other made up a household. And as we know, um, and we'll hear about more today, that's not how most American families look. In some ways, this event uh, embodies, I can say, uh, with pride in my colleagues' capacities, um, uh, really the Urban Institute value proposition. Because in order to explore this well, uh, we were able to bring Liz Peters' expertise in a changing American families together with Elaine Mugg's expertise in uh, the administration of taxes and the child tax care uh, credit, and uh, I think add something that uh, the conversation hasn't uh, fully addressed before. Um, uh, so uh, these uh, changing American families uh, are probably obvious because you know people in your lives like this, but they may be people who are single parents or people who are cohabiting and in fact have children together or maybe the children in the family may or may not be of those two people who are living in the household at the moment. Um, it may be children who are spending some time in one home few days a week and sometimes in another home other days a week. And they may be multi-generational homes, homes where a mother and perhaps her mother are both playing a critical role in caring for the children. And it's uh, uh, in many ways uh, emblematic of what we understand in more complex family relationships. It takes a village. Um, but our tax code doesn't always imagine the whole village being part of the family. And determining who qualifies for a child tax benefit in particular is a new question. Um, and it's a particularly interesting question because more and more of our social safety net is increasingly delivered through the tax code for reasons that another conversation can tackle um, about political economy and other questions. But as a result, the tax code becomes the question where we need to sort out how well do these uh, services benefit all of our different kinds of families. And ultimately, we know from work that others here have done that access to this, um, uh, be these benefits are critically important, ultimately, to the well-being of the children that are growing up in these families and whether or not those families have access to sufficient resources to make their life less stressful. Um, uh, so can we change the system? Can we improve the delivery? Can we make it simpler and more straightforward? This is the kind of thing that we at the Urban Institute like to do. We like to inform uh, with the analytic capacity that we have um, across all of our portfolio of issues, bringing real facts to bear on the conversations. But we also understand that behind those real facts are real people. Uh, and they are those children in those families that look uh, not much like uh, the ones that are on um, uh, po postcards from an earlier era. I want to say thank you to our panelists, particularly we're going to have full introductions from our moderator in a minute, but I want to offer my thanks to um, Francesca Jean-Baptiste and Nina Olson for being here. Um, I also want to 
uh, say, uh, I'll do the introduction briefly of our moderator, David Williams, uh, and then I will turn it over to David to take it from here. Um, David is the CTO and Executive Director of the Intuit Tax and Financial Center. Um, I should note that the Intuit Financial Freedom Foundation is one of many funders of the Tax Policy Center, and we're excited to have asked David to participate today because of his thought leadership and long career in tax policy and in tax administration. Prior to joining Intuit, David worked on tax policy and tax administration on Capitol Hill and at the IRS. Specifically, he served 14 years as a Senate staffer working primarily on tax issues and 13 years at the IRS in a number of different positions. Notably for today's conversation, at the IRS he was the senior official overseeing the EITC office and is credited for bo with both expanding EITC access while simultaneously implementing measures to reduce the rates of unintentional error and fraud. Today at Intuit, David is charged with helping lead and grow uh, uh, into its tax businesses, including TurboTax and into its professional products um, that are used by many of the tax practitioners who are interfacing with these families and customers. And in this role, David also works with other Intuit businesses to shape their strategies, engage with the external stakeholders, and support industry initiatives. So we're great, uh, grateful to have that uh, experience here as part of the conversation. And thank you, David, for being here. I turn it over to you. Thanks, Sarah. Can you all hear me? I can't, so <laughs> um, just a few words before we start. Um, as, I, as I thought about this, um, for those of you who've had a chance to read the work that we're going to discuss today and the issues around it, um, I had originally started uh, with Ozzie and Harriet don't live here anymore. Um, and then I realized that for large portions of our audience, they'd have no idea who Ozzie and Harriet were. <laughs> so let me try to frame this in a, in a different way. Um, I think uh, both in my experience in tax administration, uh, in tax policy discussions, and now in the private sector, um, there's a tendency to refer to people who complete simple tax forms as simple filers. Um, and I think that is a, uh, it's been longstanding, and perhaps at one time in the distant past that was the case. But as we look at the world today, and I think the research that we're going to talk about today and the findings from the, the panel and the thoughtful perspectives we're going to get, we realize that um, simple is probably a misnomer. And uh, we need to expand our thinking as a society, as, as participants in thinking about tax administration, tax policy, and frankly about the taxpayer who is there wrestling with the lives that, that we may, that, that the tax code has not yet imagined. Um, those things are very important to us. And so instead of talking about Ozzie and Harriet, I guess the question I would ask all of you is, how simple is simple? Really, what is simple? And are we, is there really such a thing today as a simple taxpayer? And whatever we may conclude about that, what are the implications for that question for how we think about tax administration and tax policy? And I'm joined by some people who I think will shed light on it. Um, I am not, I, I do have extensive bios and I think a dramatic reading could take an hour, so I won't do that. Um, but let me just start with our first panelist then I'll move on to the others. Um, and forgive me, my eyes are a little dry today. Uh, Liz Peters is the director of the Center on Labor, Human Services, and Population at the Urban Institute. As an economic demographer, her research focuses on family economics and family policy, specifically examining the effects of public policies such as divorce laws, child support policy, child care policy, taxes and welfare reform on family formation and dissolution inter- and intra-household transfers, and a variety of other things with regard to families and children. Um, I think, together with Elaine, uh, we are going to hear some very interesting findings today. And Liz, let me turn it over to you um, for Thank you. OK, I guess I can hear the microphones on. So um, as a demographer, I have studied the striking changes in families. Um, really over the, the changes that have occurred over the last half of a century and the implications for well-being. But until this project, I hadn't really focused on um, the idea about uh, the implications that this might have for the tax system and the uh, complexity in filing. So it's been a very interesting and fun uh, partnership. So like, let me just start out saying, well, what is the family? Well, you, you've heard the family is kind of changing and very diverse. Um, but uh, the tax system is not the only thing that doesn't recognize the complexity of families. 
Uh, the Census Bureau has a definition of the family that it uses. Um, and it says a family consists of a householder and one or more other people living in the same household who are related to the household by birth, marriage, or adoption. What's wrong with that picture? No, um, it doesn't. It, it, they've been using the same definition since 1930. Um, so families are not like that. Um, all families are not like that. They're much more diverse. Um, in fact, I think one demographer was, uh, had called the changes the convergence of diversity. Um, but many parents are not married, so the married part makes it difficult um, to, to think of families just uh, in terms of, of marriage. Um, sometimes the mother's partner is not the child's biological father, but he helps to raise the child. He's sometimes called the social father. Um, a stepfather, if the two parents are actually married, but a social father often um, if, if they're cohabiting. And often a child's parents are both, uh, con both child's biological parents are contributing to raising the child, but they're not living in the same household. Um, so I want to start by painting a picture, and you've heard a little bit of that, so I'm going to go through it quickly, of, of the change in families. And then I'm going to talk about a couple of the analyses that we did that focus on particular types of family change that's most relevant um, to this question of complexity of taxes. So as you said, that, um, ch uh, as you've heard, children used to live primarily in households with two married parents. But today, more than half of children are going to spend some of their childhood not living with both biological or, or adopted families. I'm going to say biological because there's not that many uh, adopted. Um, so that says something uh, both about um, living in complex households, but also that changes take place, that these household types are not, uh, are not stable. So what you see at a point in time, um, you may not see in the next year as well. So um, parent, children are more likely to live with a single parent, with parents that are cohabiting, and with step-siblings and half-siblings. Um, these changes have occurred in part because marriage rates are declining. And when people do marry, they're often marrying at older ages, often at ages after they've had children. Something um, that Bell Sawhill called the great crossover, where they looked at the median age of childbearing and the median age of marriage. And sometime in the last decade or so, the median age of marriage was greater than the median age of childbearing, meaning that a lot of kids are now being born outside of marriage. In 1960, 5% of children were born outside of marriage. But today, 40% of every child born is born outside to, to non-married parents. And if you look at uh, mothers who are 30 or younger, half of these kids are outside of marriage. A lot of them are living, about half of those are living in cohabiting families. Um, but the cohabiting families tend to not be very stable. So those relationships um, don't often uh, persist. The instability has led to repartnering um, so that parents have children, often with more than one partner. And that phenomenon is, is uh, referred to as multi-partner fertility. Um, that results in kids having um, uh, living with step or half siblings and parents having step kids in the household. So I want to um, highlight three types of family change that could be most problematic for claiming child um, tax benefits. The complexity that we were talking about, which we also see is much more prevalent in low income families. So when children are with two parent families, it's straightforward to figure out who are the tax filers, who can claim the child tax benefits. But when there's multiple kids in the family, who are related in different ways to uh, the adult tax filers in the household and are related to tax filers outside the household, figuring this out is a lot uh, less straightforward. In addition, there's this issue of instability. So there's complexity and then there's instability. And instability is more prevalent both for co more complex households and for low income families. Um, so in our project, we looked at um, we looked at two kinds of change. We looked at change from one tax year to the next. So kind of learn, OK, how do, I, how do I do this when you've got a certain kind of family? And then all of a sudden, the next tax year, you've got a different family composition. You've got to figure it out all over again. 
It's also another kind of, um, of instability is within a tax year. When a divorce occurs or when non-married cohabiting parents um, split up, um, then the kids are with different parents at different parts of the year. Um, or in fact, there's often uh, kids that uh, move from one parent's household to the other within a year. Um, so these kinds of instability make it difficult to figure out who, to, who, who gets to claim the kid. So um, for this project, we used um, data from the, um, uh, the Survey of Income and Program Participation, which interviews families every four months. You got to have a survey that's going to interview them a lot to figure out um, this kind of instability. Um, so we can really see changes. And, and they then ask who, what changes occurred over the past four months. So we can really see changes that are occurring month by month. So it's a kind of a cool data set. Um, and we look at uh, households in the 1996 panel, and then we look at a different set of households in the 2008 panel, which is 12 years later. So when we looked at the complexity and the changes over time in complexity, we saw what we just um, talked about, that the more complex types of households are increasing in their prevalence. The, the uh, cohabiting households, um, the, the households with step-siblings and, and half-siblings. Um, and so that all shows up in our data, even over the 12-year period. Um, so I'm not going to cover the numbers, because as a demographer, I could talk about lots of numbers. But you won't retain all of those numbers. <laughs> but I will say you know, just one thing. If you look at the um, children living in households uh, with less than uh, the low-income low households, less than 200% of poverty, at one point in time, half of them are um, not living with, uh, with two-parent families. Um, and, if you've, and that's including the step-parents. If you actually look at the kids in low-income households at one point in time who are living with two-parent biological parents, it's only 40% of those low-income households. That's it's very high prevalence. Um, all right. So looking at stability across years, um, we, married households are generally more stable. They, they, they just... And, despite, you know, divorce happens, but from year to year, from one year to the next, you know, at least 90% of them are going to be in the same household as they were the year before. But their changes are much more likely when they're married step-parent families. So uh, a marriage has occurred before. Um, so uh, in fact, changes are three times more likely <laughs> for married step-parent families than for uh, married biological families. And instability is much higher for more complex family types, especially cohabiting families are particularly unstable. And, um, and even then, when there's a non-biological parent in the household, when they're cohabiting, as opposed to two biological parent families. Um, and this instability has increased over time. So not only have the complex types increased over time, but instability has increased over time. And then let me just touch really briefly on stability within a year. Um, the same kinds of families who are more likely to change across different tax years are also more likely to change within a tax year. Of course, it occurs once, you know, if a parent's actually split up or repartner, but um, it can also occur in the, when parents are living in separate households as, within, as with uh, joint custody arrangements, joint physical custody arrangements. One study in Wisconsin found that over a 20-year period from 1988 to 2008, divorced parents with some sort of shared physical custody uh, arrangement increased from 8% to 45%. That's huge. Now, states are different. It's not the same across all states. Um, but in fact, this number is really difficult to get. So I found one study that had it for one state. So you have it there. Um, but another type of change is when a child is primarily living in one household and then moves to another household. And that happens not infrequently because of uh, social and economic changes. The, the primary parent um, may be, get remarried and the, and the partner doesn't get along with the kid, or the, or the absent parent may, may get remarried and, the, and, and wants to take the kid in the, in the more stable household. Or economic uh, changes can occur, unemployment and so forth. So this happens quite a bit, especially in low-income families. 
These types of changes are really difficult to capture in survey data because they usually ask, what's the usual, what, you know, usual living arrangements? Where is, is this, what, who usually lives in this household? What, what does that mean, actually, when kids are going from one household to another or when it changes a lot? So I hope I've kind of given you a flavor of the complexity and instability, and I'm going to turn it over to Elaine to talk more about the tax implications. Well, actually, you're going to turn it over to me to turn it over to Elaine. Hey. Um, <laughs> so uh, in a moment, we'll, uh, I would call her your partner in crime in producing this. Elaine um, is going to talk about the role uh, taxes play in supporting children. So you've just heard from Liz about all of the complexity that has continued to grow. And, the, and, and frankly, it feels like the trajectory is more of the same. Uh, but we've got a tax system that literally uh, focuses on particular definitions and makes a huge difference uh, based on the presence of children on that tax return. Um, so Elaine's going to talk about that. She is a senior research associate with the uh, Urban Brookings Tax Policy Center at the Urban Institute, where she studies income support programs for low-income families and children. Before joining Urban, uh, Elaine worked at the IRS and uh, the GAO as a presidential management fellow. It's fellow now. It used to be intern. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, um, and she's also worked with congressional staff and talked to them about the taxation on, of families with children, higher education incentives, uh, and work incentives in general in the tax code. So, Elaine? Thank you. So I think um, this project was really exciting for me because in the tax world, we don't often um, go up and visit our friends that are in the demography world. And it sort of um, showed me how important it is for us to start having these conversations because demographers have been telling us forever that the family's changing. And the tax system has, has just not been changing um, to keep pace with this. So what I'd like to do is first explain why we ought to care about tax benefits for children and then um, describe how the complexity that Liz described impacts who um, receive particular benefits. So, and I also extend thanks to um, Sarah Edelstein who is in the audience. She is our uh, co-author who did all of the complicated data work and um, it's really hard to eke out some of these numbers from the SIPs, so thank you for that. Um, in the paper, we highlight five child tax-related benefits, and we do that because we often think of these as a suite of benefits, and this suite of benefits sort of covers the whole income distribution. Um, it's the earned income tax credit, which goes to low and moderate income earning families. There's the child tax credit that goes to both low income families and um, you know, higher up the income scale. Then there's also a dependent exemption. You get to lower how much you owe in taxes based on how big your family is, how many dependents are in the household. If you're a single parent, you can get head of household filing status, which allows you to um, have taxes at a little bit lower rate than if you were um, a single person without children. And then there's the child, credit, the child care credit, which is um, much smaller than the other benefits and mostly goes to middle and higher income families. So together, these um, programs deliver $170 billion of benefits to families with children every year. And 90% of all families with children are touched in some way by at least one of these benefits. Um, for those more familiar with the transfer side, um, we often think of the EITC as the same size um, as SNAP. They sort of go back and forth which one is bigger. So it's a big deal in the lives of low-income families. Um, a little more than half of all the tax benefits go to families in the lowest two income quintiles, so the lowest 40% of the distribution. So it um, really can impact um, the bottom line for these families. On average, families receive tax benefits for children that are worth $3,600 a year. That number is a little higher for families with lower incomes, and it's lower for families with um, very high incomes who don't benefit from all the programs. Um, According to my Urban Institute colleague, Julia Isaacs, 40% of all um, public investments at the federal level for children are delivered through the tax system. So we ought to care about what the tax system does and how it treats families. And with that background, I want to make three points. The first is that tax benefits are distributed to tax units, and tax units are not always families. The second point is that tax benefits are for most cases a winner take all, which means you cannot distribute the tax benefits across multiple households except in certain cases or to multiple people within a tax unit, uh, within a household. 
regardless of who delivers care or support to the child. And then the third point is that at the end of this conversation, we're going to talk about how complicated it is, how confusing it is. We still might decide that the tax system is the right place to deliver the benefits. It does a mostly good job of it. But I'm hoping that we can sort of, with this line of research, start raising awareness so policymakers have at least some sensitivity to what's going on in people's lives as they approach the tax system. So the first um, point, that tax benefits are based on tax units. Traditional transfer programs can provide assistance based on the people who the child lives with. So that might be quite different than the actual tax unit. Because the tax unit is defined once a year when you file your taxes in the spring. And it's based on what your um, household looked like and the legal relationships that existed in that household on December 31st of the prior year. Um, you either get the benefit or you don't get the benefit based on whether you're in the tax unit. Um, our research showed that children who lived in families with at least one um, non-biological child were more likely to live in homes where parents or children changed throughout the year, which the tax system cannot be sensitive to. And so we find that the um, tax unit line between families is blurred between families. So many families can exist in, or many tax units can exist in one family. An example of this would be a cohabiting couple. There's no legal relationship between the couple. Um, they may both have a biological relationship to children in the household, but only one of those people will be able to benefit from the child um, tax benefits. The second point flows from that is that a result, as a result of the placement in a tax unit, the tax benefits end up being a winner take all. And what I mean by that is tax benefits are linked to a single tax unit. And regardless of how tax custody is shared, only one tax return will claim each benefit. So an earned income tax credit cannot be given to two households for the same child. A $1,000 child tax credit cannot be split across two households based on who supports what. One person, one tax unit will get all the benefits. Um, the exception of this is if you are divorced or legally separated, there are some benefits that you can assign to a non-custodial parent, and that's the de dependent exemption and the child tax credit. Um, so you're treated differently if you're divorced than if you were never married, which can be you know, a, a disparity that we might want to think about. And the third point I want to say is that even though it's confusing and it may cost families literally thousands of dollars for making the wrong choice about how they file their tax returns, it still might be the best we can do. Um, so the tax system still delivers benefits um, quite efficiently because they know a lot about the family to income because that information is already coming to the IRS. It's administratively simple to deliver some tax benefits relative to transfer benefits, mostly because of the, the complexity that the tax system wipes out and that it's an annual benefit and people are already filing tax returns to claim it. Okay, thank you, Elaine. Um, <clears throat> Our next uh, commentator uh, is a woman who needs no introduction. <laughs> uh, uh, Nina Olson is the National Taxpayer Advocate and um, probably one of the most prodigious thinkers about the issues that we're talking about today. If you have not read some of her reports to Congress, um, book several weeks because they are, <laughs> they are thorough, uh, they are comprehensive, and they are in-depth uh, analyses. And Nina has probably done more thinking about the kinds of issues we're going to discuss than anyone. Um, she today, Not I think, is, David. Well, um, I think she's going to talk about, you know, the challenges the IRS faces in in the face of what you've just heard described uh, by our two co-authors uh, and the realities of what that looks like from the IRS perspective. So, Nina, I'm actually going to just do that a little bit and then go to what I'm currently thinking and looking at in terms of solving some of these problems within the tax system. Um, so the first thing is that stunning statistic of what percentage of federal benefits for children are running through the tax system. And the first stumbling block we have there is that the IRS basically defines itself either as an enforcement agency 
or as really a production agency, it, you know, pro a processing agency. It produces 140, 150 million individual tax returns and 10 million business entity returns each year. And we just got 170 million new information returns from the Affordable Care Act this year. So when you know, it thinks it has a lot of responsibilities and somewhere stuck in there are these families with this very complex structure that need a lot of assistance in figuring out what's the right way to do things. And what has always struck me over the years is people talking going back to 75 or really 90 when you have the expansion of the EITC that really the reason why you want to put the benefits to the tax system in addition to having the income information is that you, know, you do away with the stigma of welfare. Um, and yet we are, the, the downside of that is that, or the benefit of having a face-to-face -face interview with a caseworker is that you get to figure out in some of the ways at least what the structure of the family is and where you might be at risk of having family structure change over time and things like that. And I can tell you right now, none of that happens in the IRS, whether it's an audit or customer service or taxpayer service or anything like that. It's just not built that way. So for years I'd been saying to the IRS, what you need to do, at least on your audit side, is staff it with employees that have a social work background. So that when we're doing the 400,000, 500,000 EITC audits a year, you are actually finding out, instead of trying to put them into this processing chain and this production line, you're actually talking to them about their structure and educating them about how the rules might impact their structure. And if their family structure is changing from year to year, they may not be eligible this year, but they may be eligible for last year. I've been in this position for 15 years as of March 1st, <laughs> and um, I'm here to say that I've given up on that. Um, <laughs> I honestly don't think the IRS will ever get around to hiring people with a social work background. Um, I've been arguing that for years. So that's gotten me looking outside of the IRS to see how other countries are dealing with these factors. And I'm, I am very perverse because I do spend a fair amount of my personal vacation traveling to other countries and meeting with tax officials on my own dime. <laughs> Um, because the IRS doesn't have the funds to send me there, nor probably would it, you know. But um, if it did have the funds, but I'm, I'm going to, you know, I do this. So I am going over, to, I've been talking with folks in Australia and in, with UK, in, and in the UK. And each of them have variations on a family and a worker credit. Um, in some instances, they looked at our EITC, decided to bring welfare into the tax system. We said, why? And they decided that they would do this and then change their structure a little bit. And they've both been living with this and they're now moving, both of, both of these countries are moving into a particular direction that I find very interesting. Australia already partners, the, the family credit is administered through the tax system and the Department of Human Services. And the entity that is actually determining eligibility, taking into account all of these diverse family structures is the welfare agency. And then they are turning to the tax system to do the disbursement, the reporting, you know, getting the annual reconciliation for you know, how much should have been paid out versus how much was once the person is filing annually, um, and then reporting that back to the Department of Welfare, who will then also do the eligibility for the next year. So you have this sort of tasking out to the different agencies the aspects of the benefit that they do well. And you're not asking the other agency to do something they don't do well. UK actually has a whole bunch of little credits. And by 2017, they're going to unify them into a universal credit, which will be administered by HMRC, Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs. And I do want to have that in our type note. Um, <laughs> and, um, what, Majesty? Yeah, I don't know, no, it's something uh, like that, you know, but that just sounds so wonderful. Um, and then the Department of, of Work and Pensions. And again, it's this bifurcation of eligibility determination and then the more bookkeeping and disbursement and collection, you know, of overpayments. Now, I've described this. There's one thing that they have that we don't have, which is pay as you earn, which means that in terms of income, the income aspect of how you fluctuate is reported to the agency in real time every two weeks for each human being. And so UK is actually developing a system to send texts because they know a lot of this network, this level of, 
this income level they don't have online, but they do have smartphones that, are, that can receive text, little reminders saying, up, oh, we see your income going up by this much. You may want to come in and t let us know that your circumstances have changed so we can change your benefit a little bit. What they don't have is what happens to the family structure changing. But they have been doing a lot of work about how to get people to come in and report changes in family structure, changes of circumstances. Now, I have used a lot of words that should be, in the last two years, very familiar to us because of the Advanced Premium Tax Credit and the Affordable Care Act. So we now have exchanges in our country where people are coming in in advance, getting their eligibility determination about their household structure, which is different from our tax unit. And, they, and then the IRS is sending the exchanges, the income information, so that the eligibility determin determiners can decide whether this person, you know, how much of a premium, advanced premium tax credit this person is eligible for. Then the IRS gets the reconciliation form, does the math, looks at what the return really is, and then does the collection. So I have been thinking, and I am continuing to noodle through this, but that perhaps some of the way of dealing with this complexity is to go, this family complexity, is to go and uh, to think about whether we could actually expand the duties of the exchanges and the networks that they've created in the communities, the people who are helping to qualify people for the advanced premium tax credit, et cetera, to have them doing the eligibility determination. The IRS is providing the income information. The IRS is doing the reconciliation. And then the big problem, and we will learn from ACA about this, is how people are doing with reporting their changes and circumstances during the year. I have preliminary, my staff has preliminary pulled some data just about income changes, um, you know, during the year. And what that, for the first year of the Affordable Care Act, 2012 data was used to qualify you for what you got in 14. And what was the gap, but what were the changes between 2012 and 2014? And we're even looking at changes in f household reporting structures between 2012 and 2014, 13 and 14 to see what that does to just sort of size out how much, based on whatever return information we have, is fluctuating. Again, it's annual. So we're missing some pieces, but that is actually where I'm going. Um, the last thing I will say about it being in the Internal Revenue Code, and we were just talking about this a little earlier, is that you're under a completely different penalty structure. And it's sort of a, uh, an outcome of your thinking about the taxable unit. And the benefit really goes to the taxpayer. Right? You know, the person who's on the line as the taxpayer or the secondary taxpayer, not to the, to the child, like many other welfare benefits, you know, social benefits would go to. And so when we say, when we penalize you, particularly where we have the two-year ban, you are eligible for the EITC, but because you declared it, claimed it recklessly in intentional disregard of the rules a year before, you are zeroed out completely. It's not just that you, the taxpayer, is zeroed out, but the entire unit is zeroed out. So that child may still live there. That child may still be eligible for it, but that child is punished for the behavior of the parent. And that is something that we have not been thinking about greatly in this, and I think we really have to think about that once we embrace EITC as actually benefits being run through the tax system. Thanks, Nina. Um, our last speaker, uh, Francesca Jean Baptiste, um, is the senior program manager at the Maryland Cash Campaign. Uh, she provides training and technical assistance to the campaign's volunteer income tax assistance partners statewide. She received her JD uh, from Washington and Lee and it, uh, Law School and is working on her LLM. And um, I would characterize what we're, we've asked her to do is provide a dose of reality. <laughs> uh, into this conversation because she has, I think, frontline experience in actually dealing with the kinds of families about which we've heard uh, statistics and insights um, and proposals for, um, forgive me, government expansion um, that, we, that we need to understand exactly what, what the front lines are like at yeah. the moment. So, Francesca, please take it away. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, so just a little bit of a background about the Maryland Cash Campaign. The cash in our name stands for Creating Assets, Savings, and Hope. 
and we do that in many ways, but most importantly, we provide free tax preparation assistance um, to low-income individuals and families. Uh, we serve about 20,000 taxpayers statewide, and um, as I am here to provide a dose of reality, I will tell you that um, the tax system is quite complex for the families that we are seeing come through, come through our doors. Um, in recent years, we have seen many multi-generational families. So, you know, we no longer have mom, dad, two kids, and a dog. We have grandmom, mom, and children, um, all of whom are contributing to the sustainability of a household. And so that becomes quite complex when we're trying to figure out the filing status for these taxpayers. So most importantly, who is head of household? So nothing is more interesting and intricate than explaining to four different people who all live in one home that everybody can't be head of household. We can only give that to one person. And so we have to you know, go through the steps. Um, most of our clients are very um, well, understand the terms head of household. They know about dependents. They know very well about the earned income tax credit. But they don't necessarily understand that there are requirements for those, um, for those tax benefits. You can't just say, oh, this so-and-so lived in my home for a couple of months. I'm going to claim them as a dependent, and I'm going to get the earned income tax credit. Um, so we have to go through all the tests with them, try and explain it to them in a way that makes sense, because sometimes when you read the straight tax code, if you've ever had the pleasure, um, you know that it doesn't necessarily make sense. Um, and so explaining it to these folks is a little bit difficult and challenging, but also trying to ask them questions. I feel like a detective often when I'm trying to ask someone, so how many people actually live with you? How many months did they stay with you? And then you know, getting to define support. Um, you know, we're just really trying to get folks um, the right determination under the tax code. And that can be really, really challenging for a lot of these families. Um, we see that there are a lot of folks that are coming in, um, as Elaine said, with children that are, not sta that are in households that are not stable. They're moving in and out of families, um, living two months here, three months there, five months there. But then the thing about it is that all of the folks that they're living with want to come to a tax site and say, I'm head of household, I want to claim this one child. Um, and so what we see is that it turns essentially into a race to the tax preparer to see who can get there first and claim the child, even if they're not, uh, if, even if they're not supposed to. And their only recourse is to go through the IRS reconsideration system, which a lot of folks, because it takes a lot of time, and you know, there's a request for a lot of different documentation, so medical records, school records, to try and pinpoint who the child actually lived with, because that is really difficult um, to, to pinpoint, to pin down, especially as these, folk, as these children are moving through different homes in one year. Um, we also see this with older, with older children. We see that um, a lot of un undergrad students and graduate students are no longer moving in, out and into dorms. They're staying at home, living with their families um, and their parents, but also are working to pay for college tuition and for their living expenses. And so when it comes time to claim um, that, that student, there's a tension between the parents and the children because when you have a qualifying child, there isn't necessarily an income test. There's a support test. And so we have to sit down and figure out, well, who is providing more than half of the support for that student to be claimed? And so a lot of times there's a little bit of tension there. And so we have to explain to folks why you may not be able to claim that student, um, why it's more beneficial that they should claim themselves, um, especially when they're you know, earning significant amounts of income and also have student loans in their name or paying tuition in their name. So it, it's really difficult. Um, and you know, it's one of the hardest parts of my job is explaining to someone why their tax um, refund is $2,000 less than it was last year. Because folks already come through the door having mostly spent their tax refund in their head, right? And so it's quite devastating when I have to tell them, you actually didn't qualify for the earned income tax credit, or you actually don't get to claim that person as a dependent um, for the year. Um, on the other hand, um, there are days when um, we have unexpected surprises that are more positive. So two weeks ago, we helped um, a, a client um, file her taxes. And she had never qualified for the earned income tax credit before. Um, she works as a housekeeper in one of the hotels in Baltimore City. Um, and she, her wages are slightly over the threshold for the earned income tax credit for a single filer. But she had taken in her grandson um, because the mom was away for whatever reason. Um, and she supported him. And so she was able to claim a dependency exemption for him get head of household status, and get an, a $2,000 earned income tax credit. And she had no idea. Um, she was ecstatic um, and really excited and told us that she was going to use that refund to buy a used car so she could get her grandson to and from um, football practice with greater ease. So um, that is one of the positive um, <laughs> stories that I have to share. They're not all positive, obviously. But um, it's just to point out that it is, it is complex with these family structures that we're seeing. Again, a lot of folks don't understand that 
it's not always going to be the same tax situation for you every single year. Um, as people move in and out of your house, as your income fluctuates, there go there's going to be a difference in refunds. And so having to explain that to folks, especially when it comes to breaking down the structure and you know, the children that are living in and out of their homes, um, it's really quite complex. And so I'm hoping, Elaine, that we can do better. <laughs> with, <laughs> with, I mean, it, it does function, there, it does function, but I am definitely hoping that we can do better um, especially with the Affordable Care Act adding an extra layer of complexity. Um, there is nothing worse than explaining to a taxpayer that they are not getting a refund because a dependent that they claimed on their tax return didn't have insurance and they have to pay a penalty. And so where they normally would have gotten a refund, they aren't. So again, hoping we can do better. Nina? <laughs> well, you know, I, mean, I think what's really interesting about some of what you're saying, all these little rules, one thing about UK and Australia, they both have in their definition of who gets to claim the credit, the, the family portion of the credit, um, is the, the term is main carer. Now, if you've read the Internal Revenue Code to look at the definition of you know, qualified child and qualifying relative, and I claim some guilt on that, you know, making, having made the legislative yeah. recommendation <laughs> that we do that. Um, but the point is, the, that's a lot different than main carer. And what I haven't been able to find, find when I talk to the officials, they say, well, it's whoever's taking care of the child. Really? <laughs> you know, well, how do you decide that? And I have not seen the detailed instructions to staff about how do you determine who the main carer is. Mm -hmm. So that's partly why I'm going and doing my tax vacations, to try to <laughs> ferret that out. Because it may be that their instructions are as detailed and labyrinthine as ours are, but it may be, and this is what I'm wondering, are they willing to live with, you know, as long as we know the kid exists, mm -hmm. nobody else is claiming that kid, and, you know, the income is in the right area, mm -hmm. then do we really care? If the benefit is going for the benefit of the child, do we really care about the relationship or this or that? And the other thing I'll throw out on the do we really care or why should we care is why can't there be at least two heads of household? You know, um, why can't there be when you have parents who are living separate and they each have separate households and they're taking care of the child and yes, maybe one less than the other, but that other is taking care of the child and don't we want a public policy that makes people accept parental responsibility for the child. And so why couldn't there be two heads of household? I actually want to stop there yeah. and just say, we're going to have some dialogue, as we're already having. Um, <laughs> I totally and then uh, we'll open it up for some questions. So uh, if you do have questions, get them ready. I we just want to start engaging a little bit. Um, and Nina, I actually want to uh, take off from where you started, because um, to me, when I hear what I've just heard about complexity, um, I have not heard one of you mention the word that comes immediately to mind, which is simplification. Mm -hmm. um, because one would think that um, w what you're seeing is an evolution and, in fact, demonstrated trend to more complexity in individuals' lives with a tax code that doesn't mesh and continues not to mesh. And so in the era of a world where um, we are discussing tax reform, Lord knows what will happen with it, um, but we, kn we know that that's a conversation that's happening. Uh, we know that simplification is something that has a significant set of benefits for, I think, virtually everyone, particularly in terms of understanding. So, Francesca, uh, what, you, what you highlighted for me, which is something that I continue to have to remind myself, is you're, you're having to explain to people all of the, the ways the tax code works. And let's remember that the whole point of all of the tax benefits in the code is to reward or incent behaviors or, or conditions. And, if you don't understand what they are, how, how do they work? Right. Right. So um, with that as an opener, I would just ask, and, you know, Elaine and, and Liz, you, um, you both talked about um, the complexity in different ways, but I just wonder about the, the, an area that isn't as stable, which is cohabitation, where it sounds like there's a prevalency of, of um, cohabitation and changes in that that really affect the ability to file. And I just would be interested in your thoughts on on what's happening in that space and how we should think about it in terms of taxpayers' ability to file their returns. Well, I'll say one thing about that. I, I am I'm probably less concerned about the complexity when they're living together because hopefully when they're living together they, they cooperate enough that they can you know, do it 
for the child and so forth, but I'm more <laughs> worried about the fact that there is a huge amount of cohabitation and cohabitation is unstable. So when they split up, and especially when, because half of the kids born outside of marriage are born to cohabiting parents. So half of these kids and these parents are very, very, very likely to split up. So I think that's the case where it's much more difficult. Um, so it's the consequence of starting out as cohabitation. And then instability. Yeah, and then instability that I'm, I'm more concerned about. I think from the tech side, it's just a particularly difficult situation to deal with. And it's one place where you, know, you can literally lose thousands of dollars if you pick wrong. So the rules <coughs> allow that, assuming both people in the cohabiting couple are biologically related to any children in the household, the parents can just agree who's going to claim the benefits, um, the, whole, you know, the whole suite of benefits. And if they do that correctly, they might get you know, a substantial EITC, their child tax credit, you know, some other benefits. If they choose wrong because they're not sure the implications of putting the child on one return versus another or not splitting, if there's two children, you should, you know, divide them up to optimize your EITC. You know, they're at risk of losing a lot of money. And then the flip is that it's a little bit bizarre to me that a cohabiting couple can end up so much better off if they have a certain income split than a married couple that you know looks identical except they share a legal relationship and so when there's these inequities and differences in treatment in the tax code I think it's something we ought to you know give a little attention to okay um, I just like to add one more thing about that so um, what we're seeing on the ground a lot with a lot of cohabitating couples is that they like to live separate financial lives and so um, while it might be beneficial for them to talk about who should claim the child, you know, one or more children to get the maximum um, of these different, this suite of benefits, a lot of them don't like to talk about money with each other. And it will just be the biological parent that will just claim the child regardless of what's going on with the other cohabitating, with, it, with their other uh, cohabitant, is something that we are definitely seeing. And, you know, we try and talk to them about it, but, you know, people are stuck in their ways and they just don't want to mix, um, you know, their finances. And one of the reasons that is often cited is, well, it, we might break. We might break up, and we don't want to be linked. We don't want, um, you know, to be linked in that way if they just decide tomorrow that they want to leave. Um, so, that is one thing that we are seeing you in know, that thing. One third of the EITC population, you know, this statistic really well, cycles in and out each year, and I just keep thinking, how do you learn? You know, I mean, it, it, you know, it, and the reason why you might become eligible or not eligible changes each year. You had a, another kid, but you got more money in your job. <laughs> You know, it's just there is no lesson learned from that because it's so complex. Um, I, I think, you know, the other thing that I think a lot about is that you have this population of the taxpayer. It's now, what, 22 million, 26 million in taxpayers that are, that are claiming the EITC? That's a huge number of human beings the IRS is interacting with or the tax code is interacting with in one form or another. And when it feels irrational, you know, that's what your message is, that your government doesn't recognize your circumstances. It's irrationally, you know, setting rules on you that have no interaction with your lives, the reality of your lives. Mm -hmm. And how does that create trust and respect? Or for, compliance. Or compliance, exactly. And, and then, like I, as I said earlier, then you have it, this put in an agency that primarily defines itself as an enforcement agency. And so you're looking at non-compliance and you're casting this whole, you know, you're assuming that they are doing something deliberate rather than just listen to what we've been talking about. I mean. Yeah. You know, I do, I do want to call out, um, if, if you'll note in the paper, it's not the subject of this meeting, but you can't, you can't okay. separate it. Um, the last 20 years have seen most public policy embedded in the tax code for a variety of reasons, primarily um, uh, clamps on spending. Uh, having spent many years on the Senate Budget Committee and watching all these artificial ways of trying to cut down spending, uh, we succeeded um, with an unintended consequence, which is that the tax code is now packed with micro-tuning of each and every possible um, benefit, including, to your point, Nina, um, I, I think, I think it, I'm not sure this is the answer to your question, but I would push back a little bit and ask, in that environment where policy is effectuated through the tax code, how likely is it that given, given that, and also the, the compliance challenges with some of this work, that um, 
we can effectively um, say, never mind about all of that, whoever gets the child gets the child. Is that, is that a realistic way of, I, I, well, you know, I really want to look at data. I really want to, you know, I mean, your data is helpful, but I mean IRS data, you know, and sort of think of it from the point of view of how the IRS does things and make the case about if you took this approach, you would really get some relief here, both for the taxpayers, you would get the money more to the correct people, and you would reduce error. And the poster child of that is changing the tiebreaker rules. You know, back in 2000, we had these tiebreaker rules about, you know, only this person could claim the child, and, and if this person didn't, then no one got the benefit. And in 2000, you know, I guess it went into effect for 2001, but the tiebreaker rules were changed, which were much more common sense, sort of along the lines of if you've got both parents and one claims the child and the other doesn't, then who cares between the two parents if there's no dispute? You know, multi-generational household, you just need to make sure it's the person with the highest AGI, you know, that's claiming it. If there's a, just, you know, if there's a, and the biological parent gets the, gets the child, you know, in, in terms of the rules. But that, those were clearer rules, and it eliminated things that we called non-compliance in the last treasure, in this treasury study from 1999. They suddenly whoop, became non-compliance, whereas in that study, uh, tiebreaker rules were something like 20% of the non-compliant payments. Mm -hmm. They're down to like 6% of non-compliant payments now. Yeah. And that's in a very complex and even more complex demographic society. So I think we shouldn't belittle the power of little changes, little common sense changes that reflect how people live their lives and what that can do. Absolutely. So. But one related kind of issue is the, what Ling was calling the winner take all. Yeah. Um, and when the parents are in different households, um, that can be difficult because it won't necessarily all go to the child. If the child's living half and half and all goes to one parent and the other parent doesn't get it. Um, in child support rules, they actually have, in the child support guidelines, many states have explicit um, um, provisions when to, to uh, take into account the visitation or the custody arrangements so that um, you know you have a guideline amount that is specified if the child is living 100% with the mom and if then in reality the kid is living 20% with the dad then that amount that goes to the mom is reduced. Mm -hmm. So there are certain kinds of public policies mm -hmm. that were de designed for the specific mm -hmm. complicated case that do take into consideration um, this kind of split of time and responsibility. So it's able to be implemented, although I don't know how well it's really implemented. You know, we made a legislative recommendation that you allow non-custodial parents to take head of household status and it would be tied to did you pay whatever was required or substantially all of your child support. But where I've gotten to, like, why do I care if there are two head of households is I think about how the IRS would have to process that information and the kind of audits they would do of the non-custodial parents. So I'm really moving to the line of just get us out of that. Get us out of those discussions. <laughs> just, uh, one of the challenges with simplification <coughs> is that um, in that scenario, it tends to cost money. Yeah, I know. Because it qualifies people who would not otherwise be qualified. <coughs> so again, my question, it isn't a question, it's rhetorical, which is where does that money come from? I'm um, relying on the father's lobby. Okay, well then we'll let that one go. Um, uh, but that points out that the IRS assumes people's time is worth nothing. Exactly. Right. So there's a cost being borne by all the taxpayers too. You know, that we only look at how much we're going to pay out. But I, I, I absolutely agree. Um, I, Elaine, let me ask you though. Um, one of the things I found interesting, uh, there were comments in your paper about um, the difficulty in actually having a, any kind of third party that would verify some of the data that is actually integral to calculating eligibility for benefits. And I wonder if you could unpack that a little bit more for us. Right, so the test for who gets to claim these benefits is often who did the person trying to claim them live with the child for more than half the year. And I wonder, does Iris think there's someone who's like, oh, she was with me Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, I'll put a star on the calendar. Oh, she went with her dad these other days. You know, no one knows in these situations where children are shuttling back and forth. 
Dean has pointed out to me in middle school, everything just goes crazy, these um, relationships and you know, no one knows where their child's living. And so there is no source of data to you know, tell us who did the child actually spend the night with. So then you rely on things like school records that Nina's talking about, which may not give you know, a good indication of where the child lived. So you know, the IRS is not gonna be able to develop a third party data source to enforce this part of the law. No, and in fact, um, having run EITC and refundable credits, we sought all external sources of truth. Um, inter <laughs> in interestingly, um, the IRS is often able to obtain data from other agencies, though not always, uh, but it is prohibited from ever sharing data with other agencies, which is a, a challenge. Um, I, I find this interesting, though, because um, that notion of verifying the truth basically come, boils down to what Francesca is talking about is literally uh, the well, caseworker model. Mm -hmm. Pulling out a calendar and just saying, all right, well, let's talk about April. Let's really try and think about what happened in that month. And, you know, just basically trying to figure out. And this takes time. You're going through month by month because you need that 183 days. That's the magic number. And if you can't get there, then you don't get the, you don't get the benefits. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, and we have found in some situations where no one gets the benefit or multiple people get the benefit. And then that's where we see that race to the tax repair. It's who's going to get there first to do it. Well, I think this is the point where I tell my Korea story again. I know a number of you have heard this story, so forgive me if you're hearing it a second time. Uh, but uh, when I was running the EITC program, Cor the Korean government came to me and said, we'd like to establish an earned income credit. And uh, I spent a lot of time extolling the benefits, including how many millions of people, families, it lifted out of poverty. Um, and then I mentioned that there was just this one small problem, <laughs> which is the 25% Er erroneous payment rate. It varies, but it's somewhere in that range and has been historically for 20 or 30 years. Mm -hmm. And um, so he said to me, well, why do you have this error rate? And I said, well, because we, there are basic elements unknown to the government. Who you live with for how long and what your relationship was to them. And then he said, that's not a problem for us. <laughs> um, and the rest of the joke is that was South Korea, not North Korea. Uh, but, but I think the, the point is that there is a sort of a, a tendency to think that somehow we can put together the government database that's going to solve everyone's problems when in fact um, I'm not sure our society is in the same place as a Korea or frankly Sweden or, Sweden UK. or UK or Australia yeah, no. for that matter. So um, just my own little editorial comments on that. You know, David and I were on a, a, a task force, a Treasury IRS task force in 2002 yes. that Charles Rosati had pulled together. And um, we had a whole team of people from Treasury and the IRS researching this and, you know, to see whether there was any database that we could run these returns against, any government database that would give us good information. And sort of the diagram was, here's the EITC population and here's, you know, TANF. Here was food stamps, it was called that. Then here's this program, here's section eight, here's this. There are little overlaps, but there was no perfect like that matched with the EITC population. It just is a very big and diverse and different population. Especially as people move in and out of the EITC framework. I mean, we know from research that most folks are on it between two and three years and then they get off and then because certain situations happen, you know, they come back in and so it's really hard to capture that audience for sure. I'm going to do one more question, then I'm going to go to the audience. So please, I see one hand already, but if you have others. I just, um, one, I don't remember who said, you know, one of the, the benefits of EITC is that the stigma of, of it being a welfare program doesn't attach because it's run through the tax code, mm -hmm. right? And so mm -hmm. um, I, I do not have the precise numbers at this point, but the other comment about low administrative costs is equally pertinent. Uh, a number of years ago, I sort of racked up the overall costs of the program in terms of the percent uh, devoted to administrative costs for EITC, and I compared it at that point to food stamps before it was SNAP. Mm -hmm. um, and not surprisingly, uh, the administrative cost of the EITC is infinitesimal. It's mm -hmm. roughly 0.05% of the overall cost of, of money that goes out the door. Mm -hmm. And I suspect you can imagine that food stamps then, and I'm sure SNAP now, was mm -hmm. basically 25% of the program costs were administrative. Um, but then I wanted to juxtapose that against the error rate. 
And there the story slips, mm -hmm. flips, right? Which is mm -hmm. the EITC error rate is roughly 25%. And the error rate with TANF, mm -hmm. with, excuse me, with SNAP or food stamps was small. Mm -hmm. It was probably 5 or 10% depending. But you ended up roughly, ceteris paribus, you were essentially comparing the same percentage of program costs, but spending them in different ways. Administrative costs were low for EITC, error was high, and the other situation was true for food stamps. Where it differed and where I found the aha, which to, to, to Nina's point, is participation. Right. Which is that there were, there, despite the efforts to talk about how EITC people aren't claiming the credit, the, the percentage of people who are eligible for EITC is inordinately high, and it is particularly high among mothers with kids. Uh, much higher, uh, and it turns out somewhere in the 80% range, depending on the year you're looking. And at that point, um, food stamps was lucky to break 50%. And so I actually think, I just to underscore the points that have been made, um, how important is it, uh, as Nina, because you were mm -hmm. suggesting, how important is it that the, the vehicle by which we d mm -hmm. deliver these benefits um, consider that? Well, first of all, we did, in my testimony last year, and I can't remember which one it was, but it was maybe in March or April, a written testimony, it's on our website. We pulled together a chart of like the top 13 um, federal benefit programs and looked at administrative costs, compliant, you know, over claims, you know, error rate, and um, over, you know, just compliance costs too, and then participation rate. The first thing we found was, Government data is lousy, I just got to tell you. <laughs> so it's really old, you, know, you just kept thinking you were comparing apples to oranges, but it was the best we could find. And in terms of, if you added um, you know, error rate plus overhead together, EITC came sort of in the upper middle of all of these programs. But on the participation rate, it was in the top two or three, you know, depending on how you looked at it. So I kept saying to myself, you know, if that, what do you care about in a program? And if you can get sort of in a sweet spot about error versus overhead, then participation rate is the decider. And that's why I don't say move it out, you know, the tax system, the ease of application is huge. And that's why I'm also interested if you move the application to another agency, with different skill sets, but still not layer on sort of some of the burden of face to face or whatever, um, do you lose participation? Mm -hmm. You know, what is it? And I think we can learn from other countries before we yeah. do it. I mean, and we can refine it in our own way. Yeah, I, I, I think that's certainly anything like that would require experimentation. For me, based on my experience, the, mo the importance of the tax, tax moment mm -hmm. is absolutely critical to this. It's right. where Francesca actually can get some mind share from right. someone to actually explain to them right. what their benefits are. So. Right. I'd be concerned about losing that. So let me, um, at this point, so this gentleman over here had his hand up before I even ask, but I'll come to you next and then back there. I'm glad you uh, raised the issue of, of relative to other transfer programs, but even the entire mix of transfer programs, it's very complicated as well as these other issues. But I want to mention one other point, which you, you used the word incent, but almost nobody except Elaine there on one uh, issue of the marriage versus uh, uh, cohabiting incentive has talked about the incentive issues. And the incentive issues are very important. Um, I, on the positive side, on the upswing of the ITC, people have an incentive to actually report income that they might not in a transfer program. On the negative side, you have tax rates that are uh, disincentives. And then how the, this all fits together in terms of incentives for uh, families, and as, as Elaine talked about. So I wonder why there isn't in a discussion about complex families more of an emphasis on what e Elaine referred to very briefly. The one reason is, and, and if you're talking about incentives to change family structure, there's a huge literature on that. And, and overall, I, I'm going to say that most of the literature says that you're not finding much of an effect for any of these programs. I mean, we looked for 
decades to see if welfare payments to single mothers increase the likelihood of, of having a, of single parenthood. And maybe a tiny bit, but the, the evidence is pretty, uh, it's, it's pretty ambiguous. So I, I, I actually personally don't think that there are huge incentives to these programs, especially relative to uh, the, the fact that they're difficult to administer. And so we're not even getting all of these kind of benefits. So I think that at best, that would be a second order thing. At least that's my reading of the literature. So I would add that even if we're not causing people to get married or divorce because of the incentives in the tax code, there is a fairness issue that we can at least talk about. Um, Greg Ach and I did some work recently where we looked only at cohabiting couples. And you know, at certain points, it's, advantage, it's very advantageous to continue cohabiting. And for other couples, it's um, advantageous to marry. Mm -hmm. And you know, I think we ought to talk about the fairness of treating very like situated people very differently. Mm -hmm. Anyone else on that? Because I did want to make one final comment. Um, so I, I do think, I, I was going to say this to the end, but I, I think um, in my mind there's an, a companion piece that comes with, so we've talked about complexity among family, within family structure. Um, that's one part of where I ask the question how simple is simple. Uh, a second is uh, with regard to income, and not just the volatility, which we are certainly aware of with regard to the low-income community, but even within um, the amount of income that one, particularly in the lower levels, may receive, it may be composed of s three or four sources of income uh, that can change over time. And again, so it might look very simple on a return. It's just a dollar amount issue entered on a particular line, but it may actually reflect much more complexity. And I think when you get to incentives, whether or not, I love the fairness point, but whether or not you're actually, you think you're creating incentives for people to have children, you certainly are creating incentives for people to acquire them for purposes of the tax code. Right. Um, so I, uh, we need to be thinking about all of those things. So I'm sorry, let me, you, you were next. Yes, in the red, ma'am. Oh. <laughs> uh, Kim Rubin, Tax Policy Center. And I've also been a volunteer for a decade. So um, you thank you for joining us. <laughs> Well, you're probably very sleep deprived. Um, <laughs> so I have some stuff that might be more comments than questions first. I just sort of wanted to talk a little bit about, I mainly study states, and once you sort of start talking about state taxes and state definitions of tax units and families, it gets even more complex. Going off of that, being in DC, I would caution against trying to use uh, the healthcare marketplaces to do a lot of this. Living in DC, it's really interesting to see what it looks like for poor families if they live in Virginia versus DC and Maryland. And the fact that most of the people we serve in DC are on Medicaid mm -hmm. makes this infinitely easier mm -hmm. than trying to figure out what the penalties are for people in complex households that you need to go beyond the tax units to the households to figure out what people's penalties look like or whether it affects their returns or not. So I feel like there are these definitions and the fact that states get to make some of the decisions can impact how simple or not this is. We are talking about a federal tax code. We ain't giving the states yes, those I, But <laughs> the, the other point I wanted to make is I actually would push back a little bit about trying to separate and give part of something like the EITC or child mm -hmm. credits to multiple people, mainly because I feel like most people are willing to you know, decide that this person is providing the majority of things. But when you start dividing it, I would guess that you could end up having people who all think they're doing 60% of the work or 40% of the work. And so I'd hate to see the person who's really doing 80% of the work end up losing part of the credit because these other people can now make a claim for it. And we see that now. I mean, as I said, it's often a race to the tax preparer. When you know someone who actually comes in brings the child with them to their tax appointment, and then you know later on we find out that their tax return is rejected because someone who had the child for two months has already filed, and they're just devastated. And again, the process to do an audit, re an audit reconsideration with the IRS is just daunting to them <laughs> um, without outside assistance because. Think about this as a low-income taxpayer, and they don't have access to hire an attorney, so they have to you know, try and figure out um, what the process is, go to a low-income taxpayer clinic, maybe contact their taxpayer advocate um, to figure that process out. It's really, really difficult. So I kind of agree with you in that vein.
So I guess I pointed out more as an issue that the tax system is inflexible, where the transfer system can be more flexible. So if you qualify for SNAP and your um, child's father also qualifies for SNAP, when the child is living with you, you can go apply and you can be deemed eligible. When the family structure changes and the child is living with someone else, that parent can go in and say, look who is in my household sharing meals and they can be deemed eligible. And that just cannot happen in the tax system because we look at you at one point in time. Um, so we can't divide support. It's just a, a contrast between the transfer system. Yeah, you know, and, and let me just that would be very difficult in today's environment. This goes to David's point about how much information do we have and how much do we want our government to actually have. Um, but that doesn't mean that I shouldn't go around the world and try to figure out what other people are doing and then figure out why it works for them and why it might not work for us. And then the other side of that is to find out, you know, it looks great when you're looking at their website, but what's, you know, as a tax administrator, what are the dirty details? And that's very hard to get from the website. And that's where you've got to get it from conversations and find out, well, how really is that working for you? But we might get some surprises there. And I think that, to me, where we are right now, as we're pouring more into the tax code, but we're also pouring more penalties into the tax code for these people, we are at a point where I'm just very worried that that participation rate will go down because of the penalty structure and what people will learn saying, I don't want to engage with the IRS. They just destroyed my life for two years. So even though I'm eligible now and I could claim it, I am not doing it. And I have taxpayers who do that now. Absolutely. Right. And, and they I will think, more and more do that. I think we can also learn something from our current, the current welfare system. And, right. and, and it's yeah, morphed. Over. Because um, as much as I think there are some real benefits to being able to recertify and, and be responsive to changes in circumstances, there are also real costs. And that high administrative cost that you were talking about is one of those costs because you've got to go in uh, for many programs every six months or whatever to recertify. Right. Right. And that both adds cost to the administrative <coughs> side. It also adds costs to the families themselves and in fact, that's maybe one of the reasons right. for low participation rates. Right. We've right. got studies that right. show that exactly. people are going on and off right. of, of SNAP because right. of at the recertification period. Right. So, well, so the ability to try to to, to acknowledge changes uh, in circumstances is just going to be costly to, to me. That participation rate is to me the barometer of any change. You know because. To some extent, you can work on costs, you can work on compliance, you'll get it down to a certain level. But if you, at the risk of, if you start doing things that impose cost and that drives down that participation rate, that's my barometer, like, okay, we can't go in that direction. And, it, it, you know, Elaine, you mentioned this point, um, but I just want to underscore, is it correct that there more of the change in volatility and complexity that we would see that in the bottom two quintiles in some cases? Because I, I started really noticing that much of what we're talking about in terms of changes seemed to be concentrated in the very folks that we're talking about being the targets of the benefits. Is that fair? That's right. And that makes sense because some of the reason you're low income is because you're one income in the household instead of two right. stable incomes. So you're definitely more likely to have your circumstances change. So I have a question from the audience and then I'll come to you, ma'am. and then. But um, it, it, I think we may have touched on it with the ACA comment, but this is from Elizabeth uh, Cronin. And Francesca, I think she was looking for your insights about, um, uh, she said, uh, eligibility for Medicaid and health care tax credits are now based on MAGI, which we needed yet another definition of income. That's my editorial. Um, closely tied to the tax code. You help complex households and families understand their taxes. Do you have any insights into your clients', clients experiences applying for health insurance under the ACA? Do you think insurance, marketplaces, and exchanges, navigators, need more understanding of the tax rules in order to best serve these complex families applying for Medicare, for Medicaid and insurance tax credits? Um, I think yes, absolutely. Um, and in Maryland, we actually tried to partner with our health exchange. Um, we did a training for a lot of their navigators um, in, the, in the beginning to talk to them about the tax rules because income is kind of complicated when you're talking about the tax code. and so. We know that a lot of our clients will not go back and report um, any changes. We've seen a lot of that happen when we're doing the reconciliation process. And so one of the big um, parts of our training was 
really to drill down on the questions and you know drilling into our clients that if you have any changes you absolutely need to come back and talk to us um, we see that we like I said we bring out our detective skills when we're talking to folks about the different requirements for these credits and we tried to stress to them the importance of asking these questions you know do you plan to make the same amount of income you know it was a, it was really hard that first year because it was an estimate um, and so we really try to get the navigators to understand that you have to ask the same questions in several different ways. So you can't just come and say, let me see your W-2s, to let me talk to you about income. You have to say, so, you know, do you earn any money under the table? Are you getting any cash or tax, any cash payments, um, you know, or check payments that is outside of this W-2 and in income? So it's just really about asking the clients the same questions um, in different ways to really try and drive at the, at, you know, the most accurate answer. Because we found that when we're doing the reconciliation and folks um, have this estimate of a premium tax credit and, you know, they have an additional $10,000 in income and, you know, I always ask, why didn't you tell them, why didn't you go back to the exchange? And they will say, well, I, they didn't ask me about that you know, money when I went in and talked to them for two hours about all of my income. And I was like, how is that possible? <laughs> but, I mean, but it happens. Um, and so that, I definitely think that training um, at, the nav at the navigator level or at the exchange level is necessary um, on the tax code because they're healthcare people. And you yeah. know, the same way when we had them come to us and talk to us about the Affordable Care Act, my eyes just glazed over and I was like, oh my gosh. <laughs> this is almost, almost as bad as the tax code. Um, so, you know, I, when we talked to them, you know, it was like 30 minutes of, okay, what did I say at the beginning again? Because I, I saw those deer in headlights eyes. So, definitely. Got it. But this goes also to the incentives and, and sort of simplification, but it will cost. Mm -hmm. You know, the other countries, they have a very wide range. If your income goes up between 3,000 and 5,000 pounds, depending on whether you're a one-person family or a two-earner you know, two family, they don't care. Because the point of the credit was to increase income. So if it fluctuates, so that means that you only really have to know when there's a huge change during the year that you come in. And that simplifies the message. And then the second thing is that, that you know, you push on the message of, did you get a child? Did you lose a child, really? And, and so there are ways of doing it that simplify it, but it has a cost. Because if you're saying, I don't care about a $3,000 to $5,000 increase, then that's going to show a revenue cost. Yeah. And, and people don't want to do that. Sort of where I am is either we have to learn to live with a 26% error rate, with the EITC as it is, and stop bellyaching about it, because that's the cost of the program, or we're going to have to make some changes that not everybody will like. And you know, I am a realist, so I do not think we're going to have people quiet about a 26% improper payment rate. That's just my, I don't make years. predictions, <laughs> but. I think no. you're right about that, having borne the scars of it. Uh, Ma'am, there's a microphone coming your way. Thank you. I'm Jody <clears throat> Allen, I'm a member of the Tax Policy <clears throat> Center Board, but I also worked here at the Urban Institute way back in the 1970s. Um, on exactly these problems. And I think that Francesca points to an issue that you haven't paid enough attention to, which is that especially among lower income families, income fluctuates as well as family structure mm -hmm. enormously during the year. Now, during the 70s, we had the advantage that we had the data from the income maintenance experiments, which gave us monthly, mm -hmm. which you don't normally get. And the, in, the variations are just Shocking. enormous. And, the little model that we developed showed that you know the costs of a uh, transfer program could vary by as much as 40 percent depending upon how frequently income was reported but there's another side to it too which goes to the point that david made about comparing food stamps with the eitc and the fact that yes the error rate's higher but on the other hand it's much less expensive to administer but there's another facet to that, and that is that these uh, many multi-billions of dollars that are being spent in the name of children, you have to ask yourself, how likely is it that when that family at the end of the year gets an extra thousand or two, that that money goes to the kid? Now, I'm sure some of it does, but some of it <laughs> doesn't. And there's a great, I mean, these are trade-offs. There's no obvious answer, but they need to be thought about. Uh, a welfare program, yes, it's a mess to administer, whatever, but it's more likely to go to the mother who has the kid. 
then a tax benefit may go to uh, a person who isn't even living with the kid right at the moment. It's just an yeah. issue to raise. So um, I want to make one comment about that, and then one more. we have time for one more question. The comment is, um, I mentioned income volatility and composition earlier. I just think we also need to be cognizant that uh, our economy is changing, and more and more people are becoming um, self-employed. Uh, and we've actually done some work at the Tax and Financial Center research around this that suggests that as much as 40% of the workforce will be self-employed in some form or have self-employment income within the next five to 10 years. Um, and I think the sexy part of this, which I'm sure many of you have seen, are all the stories about the gig economy and you know, Uber drivers and so on. The reality is that as our economy begins to change and, and things like income, health care, and retirement all decouple from the employer and become the individual's responsibility, the volatility and all of the policy implications of that are ahead of us. So we'll need to keep that in mind. Sir, you had your hand up for the longest period of time, so yours is the last question. Hi, I'm Vic Miller. I'm mostly retired fiscal economist. I've worked in most federal fiscal agencies, including the Budget Committee. Um, and I wanted to point out that Ozzy and Harriet still do live here, about half of our population, but a lot of other people have moved in, and probably in different percentages in different parts of the country. We are a federal country. And that's the point for Nina here, is that um, most of the people who do eligibility determination for income-related programs in this country are state employees. And uh, how would you handle that kind of a, of a structure in terms of determining eligibility for federal tax benefits? I actually don't know. I mean, I, I think that that's one of the things that we have to think about. Could I just add one more thing? Yeah. Um, I mean, do you have any thoughts on that? No, I mean, I in addition to all that, I've been a PTA president in this city, <laughs> and I've seen what happens with uh, people and uh, kids living with, living with their grandmothers to be in the right school zone, school or uh, principals pushing parents to uh, illegally uh, get eligibility for school lunch, because that's how the Title I monies get allocated. So if you're doing anything, stay away from the school statistics, please. <laughs> Well, I mean, and that's actually some of the problem is that the, one of the favorite things the IRS asks for in audits is bring in your school records. And the school records show that the child is living with the grandmother. Well, the child's not living at the grandmother's address, but that's the address to get that kid into that school district. And then you have to scramble, but that's done the audit. That's like you're done. I want to say something about the self-employment thing. As more people are self-employed in this lower income thing, more of the earned income credit will go to offset the self-employment tax. Absolutely. You know, so that... It won't be going to the child. It will be going to another form of tax. Yeah. That should be really interesting to track. I, 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 look, it's an exciting and interesting world. Um, <laughs> it's a challenging world. Uh, there's no shortage of issues. I, I actually think um, the two of you have shown a light on something that has been sort of implicit in the way in which our, our world is evolving. But I think it's, it calls out. Uh, the challenges that face tax policy and tax administration, and they're really worth considering. I believe there's more to this conversation than we're going to have today. But for now, let me pause, stop and say thank you to each of you for uh, joining us today. Very much appreciated, and thank you to the audience. And with that, I'll say good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank you. It's so wonderful what you've done.